I want to begin with um, an age-old question. Um, who are the Levantines, or who were the Levantines? They were, because there still are Levantines. I am one of them. Um, I don't like to think of us as an extinct species yet. Um, <laughs> now, I'm not going to get into the uh, very long definition uh, debates about who exactly can be a Levantine. Some Levantines do not like the, uh, that particular um, a word to describe themselves. They would rather be called Italians, French, and so on. But from a specific perspective, from a perhaps class perspective or status perspective, one thing that I have observed over the years studying Levantines uh, and being a Levantine is the common perception that you see both in the media and to some extent in academia as well is that Levantines are seen to be uh, captains of industry, merchants, diplomats, you know, haute bourgeoisie, basically. That's the common image that you get. And certainly, there were a lot of Levantines who were, indeed, uh, fitting uh, that particular description. Um, but for every Levantine family, which was a merchant house, which was a great uh, industrialist, and, uh, or a dragoman, and so on, there were plenty of Levantines who were artisans, um, skilled industrial workers, low-level consular workers, and so on. Um, the story of these people deserves to be um, studied. The story of these people is just as worthy as anyone else. And that's the emphasis that I try to keep uh, bringing to uh, my studies as well. Now, today we are looking at a very specific movement, anarchism. And a very specific sub-branch of anarchism called Propaganda by the Deed, which is a more violent branch of anarchism. Um, in the late 19th, early 20th centuries, anarchism in all of its different families and sub-families fascinated uh, a certain section of populations in Europe, the Near East, and different parts of the world, including South America. Uh, the Levantines were no exception to this. You would expect this, of course. Levantines were and are uh, very transnational by definition. They are the connection, the connective tissue between different uh, continents, and they have been among the first to do this. So let's look at one uh, Italian uh, anarchist, not a Levantine himself, but with huge influence in uh, <laughs> Levantine circles and Levantine communities, Enrico Malatesta. And Umanita Nuova is a, um, oops, sorry, <laughs> is, <laughs> is a um, <clears throat> newspaper that he's publishing. And in there, he says, we consider violence necessary for defense and but only for defense. And what is meant is not only defense against the physical, direct and immediate, but against them, all institutions that hold people in enslavement through the means of violence. A very radical position, certainly. And then he continues, above all, we are against government, which is permanent violence. Think of that for a moment, that perspective of the world that these people think and feel that government in every moment of their lives is permanent violence <coughs> upon them. So their reaction to it, through violence, is to free people, both on an individual level and they hope on a societal level, perhaps with a revolution. That's what they think. Um, all the violence necessary to win, but nothing more or less. Among the Levantines, anarchists like Enrico Malatesta, Luigi Galleani, um, and it's not just Italian anarchists, French, uh, Russian, and so on, German anarchists are influential as well. They, um, they form different tiers of influence. The primary influences that you see among various port city communities of Levantines, uh, this could be Smyrna, this could be Thessaloniki, Constantinople, Beirut, Alexandria, uh, Aleppo, not a port city, but nonetheless uh, very cosmopolitan, are coming from Italian, French, and German uh, origins. And then there are secondary influences in the form of the native minorities of the empire, who are Greeks and Armenians, who of course are not really minorities in the strict sense of the word, but uh, you know, they exist in their millions, and Jewish anarchists as well, especially in Thessaloniki. Um, I told you that this is a very transnational group of people, and you, you probably already are familiar with that fact that Levantines are like that. Anarchists are too. So, Levantine anarchists travel the world. They are globetrotters, and as a result, they end up in places like the United States, like Argentina, like South Africa, Zanzibar, Egypt, um, all over the Mediterranean and Europe. I will, in fact, give you the story of, this, of a specific Levantine anarchist who does all these things in a minute. But the states, their great rival, they, they see themselves locked in this um, struggle for, for survival. The states take them seriously, too. The states of the time see them as a serious threat and devote tremendous resources. Uh, we're talking about diplomatic resources, law enforcement resources, intelligence resources, military resources even, um, regardless of their state, um, of their condition, uh, whether they are at war or not, whether they are struggling or not, to 
deal with what they call the anarchist threat. These are coming um, directly from sources, from FBI uh, records, in fact, with the exception of the last line, which is a paraphrasing, but they actually struggle a great deal with understanding who the anarchists are. So the special agent in charge, who is uh, following various Italian anarchists who have just arrived from Ottoman port cities through various uh, stops in Greece and in Marseille, and then eventually uh, in the New World, he asks in a report to his field agent, well, are they anarchists? You know, can you identify them as anarchists? But unfortunately, the field agent's knowledge of ideologies is not very good at this point, so the response is maybe. Uh, they might be, I'm not sure they're talking about things like that. Then, uh, next correspondence is basically, are they dangerous? Do, do they pose a threat? After all, anarchists were spreading fear all over Europe. Presidents were being uh, assassinated. Kings were being assassinated. So this is a serious concern. Response, probably. I'm not sure. And this is quite uh, significant. I mean, it actually happens not on a single occasion, but on m not multiple occasions. Then, of course, are they violent? Well, they might be. And then, the end of that letter, it's not, wait, what's an anarchist? He asks, asks in a more diplomatic, uh, let's say, language, but he tries to understand what an anarchist is. He's actually, actually asking his uh, superior. And the entire FBI gets into a discussion about who anarchists are, and then things get worse. They have to find out who Levantines are. Because the people who came sometimes are referred to as Italians, but they were born in Smyrna. And some of them did not necessarily primarily identify themselves as Italians. Not, they, they did not call themselves Ita you know, uh, Levantines. That word was not seen with a great favor at the time, perhaps. But um, here and there, their origins in the Ottoman Empire are questioned by the FBI as well. What exactly are these people they're trying to figure out? Now, this one comes from a different state, also a state response to anarchists, and in some cases, Levantines as well. This comes from uh, the Italian state police archives in Rome. Archivio Centrale dello Stato has this, and this is not a statistical uh, study on that. What you see there is the percentage of people they have uh, pursued for reconnaissance, for in in intelligence gathering, and so on. And what is fascinating about that particular uh, graph is that anarchists were never truly a mass movement with the exception of a very few places. Typically they are marginal, few in numbers, but they cast a long shadow. They have a lot of influence and they certainly scare the states a great deal. The Italian state is no exception. This is why even when their numbers certainly do not match anything near 20% of all possible uh, groups that the state police in Italy follows, they still get a 20% representation in the reports and the resources spent on them. Now, coming back to Malatesta, <clears throat> he is invited by um, Italian Levantines in several cities of the Ottoman Empire and Egypt um, to come and give speeches. So he plans this great journey. And um, look at all the institutions that um, <laughs> are after him. The FBI and Scotland Yard are alerted by French <laughs> intelligence. Uh, American intelligence and British and Italian diplomats exchange extensive um, I was just going to say emails. I, I don't know what's going on in my head. <laughs> they did not have emails back then. Uh, <laughs> communications about uh, Malatesta and what's he, what he's doing, where he's going, and so on. And the last one is the most incredible. 33 port cities in Italy are put under alert. And Italian police, navy, and army is put on maximum alert, ready for war. This is a direct translation from the, from the Italian document. Ready for war. Why? Malatesta might cross through Italy along his way, and who knows, he'll spark revolution. So horrible. At the time, Malatesta is 66 years old, not to be ageist here, but he is 66 years old. He is sick, he has uh, serious health issues. Um, he's traveling alone, he doesn't have any money, and he has very few friends in this network. So um, it seems uh, rather extreme that states are uh, spending such effort, such resources on a single individual that they see so threatening. And he is by no means the only uh, anarchist to visit Levantine communities. That brings us to um, local responses to, to anarchism. A group of Armenian revolutionaries tried to assassinate the Sultan, Abdul Hamid, and they failed. They detonate a car, a car bomb and it kills a lot of people, it kills a lot of horses, but Abdul Hamid wasn't there at the time he was expected, so he escapes. That is Tefik Fikret, the, um, the poet and uh, the journalist, and he writes, and that, well, that's my translation of his Ottoman, Oh, great hunter, you did not set your trap for naught. You fired, but alas, alas, you did not hit what you ought. And then he goes on writing. He expected these Armenian revolutionaries to kill Abdul Hamid, who was a horrible dictator in his mind, and th that they should have succeeded. Too bad they did not succeed. 
So here we have a relatively um, political figure, very visible figure in the Ottoman Empire, in the Ottoman intelligentsia, who is not an anarchist by any means, and yet he is actually um, influenced by the acts of anarchists, by acts of violence, and he sees that as a means of transforming society, which is uh, something that certainly comes from that influence. This chart that you're looking at is an Ottoman chart. It comes from um, Ottoman surveillance of different groups of anarchists within Ottoman borders and beyond. And as you can see, <laughs> at 70%, Armenians are slightly overrepresented. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Which year? Um, this uh, covers the period between 1850 uh, and 1917, I believe, or maybe 1912. I need to check my own title. Um, <clears throat> this is not a surprise. Armenians, of course, were by far the most numerous, the most immediate threat from the perspective of the Ottoman state. Um, there were movements among the Armenian community for national independence, so any movement within an Armenian community uh, threatening revolution or bringing down the system would, of course, get a lot of attention. But look at the others. That's why, where I want you to look at. There aren't that many Greeks in there, as you can see. And there should be, you would think, because the Greeks are a very large, or Greek speakers in the Ottoman Empire at that point are still a very large portion of, of various minorities. But the difference is the Greek state has been founded. And even though there are very prominent Greek anarchists from um, cities across the Ottoman Empire, not from Greece itself, but from cities like Aleppo, from cities like Smyrna, they usually end up going to Greece and, you know, influencing anarchism and things over there rather than bothering the Ottomans too much with it from an Ottoman perspective. Italians from, uh, feature prominently, and then there's a category called um, Muslim Turkish, which is a very problematic category for the time because, of course, Ottoman authorities were never quite systematic in this. When they say Muslim, that could be anything, that could be any kind of Muslim. It could be someone who's not a Muslim, but who's not a Christian. It's a very blurry category. Turkish is also a very new category at the time. I would not, I do not like to use that, but I use it for a shortcut. Um, the idea of Turkishness as we understand it now in a nation state idea was invented in the late 19th century, formulated in the late 19th century. So the period that we're looking at would not necessarily represent what we understand by Turkish. Um, the other groups that are represented there actually represent a very large selection of people. There are people from, from <coughs> France, from the Balkans, from Russia, uh, from all over the Mediterranean. Um, there are several people from Luxembourg, anarchists from Luxembourg who ended up settled in Constantinople. Now those are the people that are represented in that uh, rather interesting uh, chart. <clears throat> But did anarchists just spread violence? Were they all about killing people, bringing down systems uh, through violence and so on? And certainly not. Uh, they established a university, Universita Popola, Popolare Libera. So that's a free popular university in Alexandria. My esteemed colleague here has written an excellent article on that, so I'm not going to go into great detail. But they do a lot of things interacting with the local communities. So it's not just a bunch of Italian or French anarchists leaving Europe, coming to the Ottoman Empire and um, trying to incite revolution among people who are not interested. There are organic ties of communities within the empire who invite them, who actually build institutions, newspapers, uh, reading clubs, libraries, and of course, uh, as you can see, a uh, university. Uh, they also interact thoroughly with Armenian and Greek uh, movements within uh, that very cosmopolitan uh, landscape. That brings me to a very unique individual. I guarantee you have not heard about this individual before because it has just come out of the archive and in my knowledge no one has ever written about it. He appears on the scene of history as a certain Cesare Camilleri or Camilleri, two names, uh, two spellings that uh, appear interchangeably in the sources. This man uh, is described in Ottoman, Austrian, German, French, British, Argentinian, and US intelligence reports. Uh, which should be an interesting person. Um, <laughs> he lives in Malta, he lives in London, he is half Italian, half British. Uh, he's described as being very tall, blonde, and thin. Um, well, he holds a lot of jobs. He goes, as you can see, he goes across five continents. Um, eventually ends up in Egypt, of all places, and everyone is suspecting him to be an anarchist. Um, these inter international intelligence agencies are exchanging intelligence about his whereabouts, so they're cooperating, trying to track him. He ends up as a police officer in, in, in Egypt. Um, strange job for an anarchist, you might think, but uh, he needs to pay his bills. That's exactly what he says. Um, except the pay isn't very good, so he quits. 
Um, at some point, he uh, ends up in Zanzibar and marries a beautiful Arab girl. That's how, how she's described. And the agent who is describing this is really upset. He actually writes that foreigners get all the good ones. And he uses some choice words that I, you know, I'm not thinking of repeating in our polite company here, but um, um, you can guess what kinds of words he might be using. Um, as he's crossing from Alexandria, and his destination is Smyrna, he's crossing um, the sea on a, on a ship um, that will stop in Greece for a moment and then go eventually to Smyrna. There is an agent behind him who is suppose, who's following him, not behind him, but following him. And he's ordered to find out if this man is really an anarchist. And the agent gets the idea that the best way to find out is to ask the man himself. So he goes on to him, taps on his shoulder, and asks, excuse me, sir, are you an anarchist? Um, Cesare, or by that point, Hassan bin Abdullah, uh, doesn't answer directly. He, uh, he sort of evades and ends up uh, in, in Greece. Um, Oh, sorry, just one moment. Um, he ends up in Greece and eventually goes to Smyrna. He, he's been tracked all along, uh, along this line. And in Smyrna, he gets uh, arrested by the Ottoman authorities and is put on a train with a police officer towards Constantinople, where he will be tried. He never arrives in Constantinople. There are no records of him arriving, no court records, no nothing. Um, but there are a few traces, two traces in particular. One trace in Cesare's strange story is that the Camilleri name, the Camilleri family, is widely spread in, in uh, various Levantine port cities. It's one of the more well-known Italian families in those port cities. So it's quite possible that he had familial ties and maybe where was helped by, by, by those ties. The second one um, is this. Going through my archive um, of unused documents recently, and this is a recent discovery, um, I found a document that talks about a certain Gaetano Bresci, who assassinated the Italian King Umberto I. Um, an FBI report in Patterson, New Jersey, talks about Gaetano Bresci, and there mentions that he has a friend with him, a tall, thin, blonde man, <laughs> Chi Camille, C. Camilleri. Maybe that was him. Maybe that, that's why all these intelligence agencies were after him. Um, how am I doing on time? Has anyone been looking at it? No. no. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> we start now. <laughs> um, I must have captivated you so much. <laughs> um, but Cesare, of course, Camilleri does represent something very significant. So I have three different uh, conclusions here. One of them is that let's drop this whole debate about terrorism and violence and so on and so forth about anarchists in this era. They were not terrorists. They are very different in their methods. They are very different in their approach. Some of them are extremely um, careful in choosing targets so, so as to avoid uh, civilian casualties and so on. This is a very distinct, very unique historical movement. So let's put that uh, on the side for a moment. The second one, though, is quite interesting, I think. Um, these states are spending massive resources tracking down a few individuals here and there. And they, are, they seem to be genuinely afraid that anarchists are going to cause serious trouble. Um, and the most telling part of this is, is this. When World War I starts, 1914, until 1918, these states, some of which are going to be on the opposing sides of World War I, continue cooperating and sharing intelligence on the whereabouts of anarchists. Think about that. Hundreds of thousands of people are dying on, on the front lines. These are enemies now. Ottoman Empire, Italy, um, France, Britain, and so on. And yet, they share uh, intelligence on anarchists, even during that time. That tells us something. The final one, though, is perhaps the most relevant um, to us at the moment. The Levantines did not just establish networks through trade, through diplomacy. They established networks through workers' organizations, through ideologies, of anarchism being one of them. And if you trace the lineage of many current global movements, environmentalism, hacktivism, um, of course, modern anarchism as well, you will see that they can uh, be traced back to this period. And among all the different um, global or early global movements of the time, 
Levantines are heavily represented, despite their tiny number in the world. They are the ones establishing these networks. They are the ones reaching out to all these different continents. They are the ones organizing communities in places as different as Buenos Aires, Patterson, New Jersey, uh, all over Europe, and of course, among Ottoman lands in the Eastern Mediterranean. So here's an entirely different way of looking at networks then. It's not just about trade, money, <coughs> banks, uh, and so on. Not that these things are not important. They are. but. Networks can be established this way as well, and the Levantines, of course, have left their mark heavily in this uh, particular field. Thank you.